got an interesting topic today. Uh, and I, before we watch the film, I, I, I want to talk about it a little bit. Because it's not a usual topic, I, I would say. Um, it is about how can I resist evil? And this is a bit stronger than how do I resist sin or temptation. When you say evil, you're, you're, you're upping the ante, so to speak. You're, um, it's a bit more serious. You're recognizing in traditional language, demonic powers, evil powers. Um, and so on the one hand, as Lutherans, we don't often talk about this. I think that's fair to say. On the other hand, we do. And um, I was made aware of this when I went to, in St. Paul, Minnesota, went to an uh, African Lutheran um, service. And there they were uh, celebrating baptism. And all they did was follow the liturgy. But they did it in a way which I just couldn't forget what they had just done. So they, they, they brought the, the child up and they brought it to the baptismal font. And then they read in our liturgy, maybe you remember this, Matt certainly will. We read three times, do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? We don't say evil, but all the forces that defy God. If so, say, I renounce them. Now, this is not a congregational response. This is a personal response. Do you renounce them? You have to say, I renounce them. You repeat that three times. Which is rare in the church. We don't repeat things. So again, do you renounce the powers of the world that rebel against God? So now a little bit that not the devil, but the powers of the world. I renounce them. Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? So sin, basically, sin, the world, and the devil is mm -hmm. what they're going after. Each one having evil forces that defy God. So it's, it's quite a recognition here. Uh, like there's not a small problem, there's a big problem. So what happened in this African service is they brought the child up and it was just kind of their tradition. They brought, I think it was from uh, Liberia, although I don't remember exactly how. And they get up and they say, you know, do you renounce? And then you know, the, the person said, I think it wasn't a baby, it must've been, a, uh, I do. But then, they spit. This was really, you had to go. <laughs> <laughs> Do you renounce the devil and all the forces to fight God? Yes. <laughs> Which was just, you know, you know, it's like, oh, what just happened there? Then, again, you renounce the world. You know? <laughs> oh. you know? And it was. You know, if you'd have been Italian, you'd, you'd have another hand gesture probably, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> I think that was the spirit of it. Oh. Yeah. Or your mom used to, you get a piece of, you know, yeah. God. Don't do that. I was more serious than just mom wiping off. It was a kind the way of not your forehead. <laughs> um, with her spittle. Uh, spittle yeah. There was like this feeling of disgust. I meant spittle, yeah. Um, understand this comment correctly it was almost as if you were shooting the bird at the devil mm. oh, okay mm -hmm. I mean, it was that, that powerful not just i'm saying i reject evil mm -hmm. but you know yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, uh, in the in the, mm -hmm. in the most forceful way which i think really caught my attention oh my goodness you know, this is uh, wow and if, you know, I'm still talking about it. So obviously it made an impression. Um, but it was important. It reminded me of a wedding service. It's a little bit different, a little bit different, but the same concept. <laughs> 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 the devil was the insect. <laughs> Drank too much, too much banana wine. It was, it, was a, it was a wedding service <laughs> in a small, small village. The church was packed. And so like, the, the bridal couple is up front. I'm going to talk about evil in a second. <laughs> the couple is up front. And the guy asks the question, you know, do you accept this woman, right, to be your lawfully wedded wife? And he said, I did. Pastor stops the service. Walks up to the young man, puts his arm around him, and starts strolling 
down the middle of the aisle. <laughs> and he has every beautiful young woman stand up. And he said, do you reject this one? <laughs> do you, wow. Now, you know, you got the village, right? So you, you, you got the field um, represented, so to speak. Do you reject that one? Oh, and of course, he explained it up. She's gorgeous. <laughs> Don't you think she's prettier than your wife? I mean, he's just playing this up. Of course, everybody's howling oh, and laughter, gosh. right? It's, it's, it's humorous. And yet something's going on here that's really serious. Yeah. And he did not let him go forward with the ceremony until he rejected every young woman in the village. Made a statement. Yeah. Made a statement. I mean, and yeah. sort of publicly with humor, with humor. Right. But you knew what he was doing. Mm. So then the young man gets, you know, goes back up. So then he asks the bride, or do you take him? Same thing, of course, that she is marched out into the uh, middle of the congregation, and now all the young guys, and they, they let's put it this way, they were not shy in trying to tempt her. So now there's this little play going, there's this little drama going on, you know, where they're all pleading, you know, one last time <laughs> that she would turn her uh, affections toward them. And I thought, you know, because I didn't know all the relationships, I bet there was at least one guy there that, that she probably had affection for or whatever. That's just yeah. the way that these things usually roll, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't know who he, but she would have had to said no to everyone <laughs> in the process. So um, it's very interesting in the evangelical world uh, when they say, well, you have to invite Jesus in your heart. Here, that's not enough. You have to reject. You got to reject something. It's not just accepting something, you're rejecting something, which is fascinating in that, you know, that uh, I just can't add Jesus onto my life and let evil uh, <clears throat> go unchecked or at least not rejected. I know evil will continue to work in my life. I know there's temptation. We know that the world's always going to play that role. But then to say this sets a marker for the rest of my life. I confess Jesus. I reject evil. Pretty powerful, actually. Now, having said all that, how have you experienced rejecting evil? Has that been even part of your own spiritual formation? Uh, do you remember a time when that was important to you, or you're saying, "Oh boy, this is this film is going to be all new stuff," or what? And I, I haven't seen this one yet, so I don't. I, I'm coming at this blank. I don't know what they're going to say, but obviously, this is part of the following the Holy Spirit, right? So it comes after the Holy Spirit retreat, and part of following the Holy Spirit is also mm -hmm, rejection of evil. So, even when I say that's the film, this is what it's about. What? pops up in your mind. What are the things you're thinking about? Oh, I, I know what this film is about. It's about this. Is that what you're thinking? Or you're going, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just along for the ride here. Yeah. <laughs> rejecting evil. I don't know if it's rejecting evil per se. I was in college and uh, my girlfriends and I, we went to a beer party. And you're uh, just just going to rain That's all right. <laughs> he has his stories. <laughs> but uh, we we got our beer and everything. And we're looking around at everything and watching people just slut and acting stupid. And we we left. This is not our scene. This was just not. Mama told me not to come. Well, <laughs> this wasn't our style. Yeah. I mean, we'd go to a place for ice cream, or, you know. Or, Sunday or a soda rather than this, but we wanted to try because everyone's talking about the beer party, the famous beer party. So we went, yeah, not for me. So my mother grew up in a piety. She grew up Swedish covenant. You know, that's like the church up here, a covenant church. They don't call it Swedish covenant not now because they'll invite anybody. Um, but the Swedish covenant was very clear on evil. You had to reject evil, which meant, and they told you what that meant. No gambling, no card playing, 
no dancing, oh. no movies. Wow. No bingo. No smoking. Probably. No smoking, right? Right. <laughs> and it, it was clear <laughs> what evil was. And they tell you, right? Uh, my mother then came into conflict because she liked to dance. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? Slow. <laughs> <laughs> so slow that the devil can't rest. I can see Ray's already dealt with his life. Yeah. <laughs> There's always a way around it. So, and, <laughs> same thing in Africa, and, and everybody answers it the same way. It's really not evil you're rejecting, and they know that. So that he, she goes to the pastor. He says, "I know you like to dance." She was like in dance classes at college and whatnot. Um, so he said, I think you have to go to his church because there it's accepted. But you wouldn't say that if you really thought it was evil. You'd say, stop dancing. It's, right. it's evil, it doesn't matter. You can't, and, and because because the pastor told her, you know, if you become Missouri Synod, they do a lot of sins. <laughs> she told him, she they told didn't him. love dancing either. <laughs> but they like to drink. <laughs> <laughs> and this caused havoc in a lot of small towns since wow. the Missouri Synod would come in and you had these pious Baptists and Methodists. Yeah. And then the Germans would drink. And not only would they drink, <laughs> they drink on Sundays. They go to the beer wow. garden. I drink on Sunday. You know, it's like, oh, oh, so, oh. <laughs> so on the one hand, you're saying, oh, evil is clear. Don't do these things. They're evil. But, but then all of a sudden you're negotiating. Yeah. And the Af in the African church, it was the same way. The bishop came up and he said, you know, we don't drink. And we find that leads to evil. And then he came to me privately. He said, but we understand the Germans. <laughs> but Jesus drank wine. But Jesus, <laughs> he said, if you drink, it's okay. Notice he's he's negotiating evil now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just don't ever drink outside your home. That was his solution. Oh, that totally. was his compromise. I see that. Now, why did he give me that compromise? Because that, that's what he did. Wow. He drank, but never so that his people can see him. Right. So then there's a bit of hypocrisy going on. Yeah. If you name it evil, it's but then evil. it's not really evil, it just becomes like a church rule mm. that we all like because. I trust me with alcohol, but I don't trust everybody else, <laughs> right? I mean, that's basically what you're right, saying. Yeah. And we find this all the time in the church where, yeah. is it really evil that we're fighting against? Or is it just some rule that we think is primarily beneficial, but really is not evil? Right. Just a good idea, <laughs> just a good idea, right? Did so, you go to scripture, right? It says, do not abuse. It doesn't say do not, right? Right, there it is. But those dens were the rules. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in a lot of area. And remember that there were massive drinking problems in the United States, oh. which is why we had uh, prohibition. Prohibition. Temperance. Temperance. And that, and that show worked, didn't yeah. it? Wow. Yeah. So so yeah. women yeah. all over yeah. time, yeah. women yeah. all over the country <laughs> were thrilled with prohibition because their whole families were falling apart. And, yeah. and some of these guys yeah. on the railroads were actually paid in liquor. Not in cash, you know. So it was. It was. An but issue. the other thing was the water was so bad. It was better for you to drink whiskey. It was better <laughs> yeah. to drink whiskey <laughs> than to drink. Yeah. You make a good point. <laughs> yes, I, mean, oh, I, I I'll never Lord. forget. Um, I went to a, a class at for OSU Winter College, and one of the lectures was. Whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over. <laughs> because, you know, mm. water is such a premium, especially in Africa. But in my first religion class, I remember at, at Otterbein, our my uh, professor was an EUB minister, and he said, I do not believe in drinking. I have taken my oath, but... I am here to tell you right from the get-go, before we get into any discussions, mm -hmm. this is a man-made law. Oh. Oh. And that's that was the end of the conversation. He said, I chose this. And then it was open to you. You yeah, choose yeah, it yeah, or yeah, you not yeah. choose it. You know, but it's a man-made law. So my father also, um, the way he handled man-made rules 
is in the ministry, he would never dance, he said, in the county where his church was. <laughs> he was just afraid of critique. Yeah. If someone saw, so we never saw my mother and dad dance until I think I must have been 14, and it was in Duluth, Minnesota. Nobody did that. And, you know, and all of a sudden we saw him dance, and all the kids were just shocked. <laughs> First of all, my parents dancing together. together. <laughs> it was just like a new concert. <laughs> No dancing at the and home. and uh, um, no going to the movies. And my dad uh, said again, man-made law. Yeah. But if my parishioners see me walking out of an R-rated movie, oh, wow. yeah. they're going to give me heck. Yeah. yeah. Even if it's just a grade, right? So I don't want to deal with that. Right. So I, I don't go to the movies. That was kind of his solution. Now, would everybody say going to a, a movie is evil? Probably not. Not evil, but there were strong opinions. Well, in the Catholics, we rated them, you know, as to yeah, whether it was for viewing. The Roman Hall who say these could be watched, these couldn't be watched. Oh, that that mm -hmm. was that much oh, of the yeah. weeds, really. Oh, and, and the priest of the sermons would even say it in a sermon. You know, <clears throat> these are bad movies that are gonna Come out. So, yeah, they had to watch it to break the law. Some Catholic priest who had to read the law. I'll drink the law. I'll drink. Professor in college uh, for religion class. And he said, the reason why I don't go out and drink publicly is because I might lead someone astray who couldn't handle it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he said, in other he things, he said, I <clears throat> try and be um, an example to others. Well, I know a lot of families that are like that, that they're not opposed to drinking, but when they have the whole family together, they do not, like I say, at Thanksgiving. For that reason, yeah. they're trying to be sensitive to the whole family, and sure. there are those in the family who have drinking problems, and they don't want to be... Because a drunk man might say something a sober man's thinking. Yeah, so... <laughs> Now, why are we talking about all this? Because if we are resisting evil, resisting the world, or resisting uh, sin, uh, wow, how do we define those? Is that on a sliding scale? Some of us would say if you grew up that way, you probably mm -hmm. would uh, view mo movies today differently than 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, drinking might be the same way. Gambling, now, if, I can't gamble. I just can't. Me neither. Yeah. I, I, because I... I it's not that I'm massively opposed to it. It's just that in our family, dad had made such an issue of it for me. I can't even, you know, like if we were going to play golf, you know, a dollar hole or something, something, I can't do it. There's just something in me that says, can't do that. Well, if and I'm pressed all the time, I'd go, yeah, just a quarter, just a quarter. You can do it. You can do it. You know, uh, I just, I, I just losing your money. That's the question. Because my father made such an issue of gambling because of his father, right? That it just kind of stuck. Other things didn't stick, but that stuck. <laughs> so, uh, what's sliding, and and then what are we rejecting? I think the principle is good that we're watched. How do you both confess to Jesus and reject the sin of the devil in the world? And what does that actually mean on a sliding scale that those things might be, that might change over time, how we understand uh, all sorts of things uh, at one time, uh, sinning, not sinning. Um, one last comment. I remember um, in some churches, uh, used to be wearing certain clothes mm -hmm. to church would be considered sinful or inappropriate. And if you were a woman and you didn't wear a hat. And I'm why was saying. that? Why was that? Covered. I would even say covering covering beauty. Right? And to, 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 I, I remember one black church, they had skirts in the back. And so if any of the young women came with two short skirts, they would just wrap them up and along. They just had a wrap around and that's how they solved it, right? Uh, now, we're just happy when kids come to church. <laughs> uh, 
So if someone's got a too short a skirt, you just go, thank God they're here. <laughs> but that wouldn't have been the case 30 years ago. No, you no, know, you would have no. um, you'd been ashamed, maybe. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we want to take a look at this now. I'm thinking about just the whole history of what we've experienced. And this really important tradition of the church of, of uh, rejecting the sun. I think we have a copy today without the uh, watermark. That I'm hopeful of. Testament is that just as behind good is God himself, so behind evil is the devil. Now that might sound a bit far-fetched, but for some it's easier to believe in the devil than it is to believe in God. I was an atheist. I had great difficulty believing that God could exist. I became a Christian. I came to believe in God. But then somebody said to me that there's a devil. And I thought, come on. It's hard enough to believe there's a God, let alone to believe that there's a devil. Part of the problem is that I had a false image of God and of the devil. I had a picture of God as an old man with a beard sitting on a cloud. Simply, I had a false image of the devil. I thought of the devil with horns, a tail, cloven hooves, and a pitchfork. Of course, those images of God and of the devil are not only unbelievable, they're also unbiblical. The New Testament talks about a, a triple alliance, like the world, the flesh and the devil. The world's the enemy around us. It's all the evil that's around us, the world that's turned away from God. The flesh is the enemy within us. The flesh is not the body. There's nothing evil about the body. It's the evil desires that come from within each of us. And the devil is the enemy above. Jesus clearly believed in the existence of the devil. He taught his disciples to pray, deliver us from the evil one. Jesus himself was tempted by the devil. So, scripture talks about the existence of the devil. Also, tradition, Christians down the ages have always believed in spiritual forces of evil. And you may have had this experience, particularly if you've had a powerful experience of the Holy Spirit. You suddenly find that there seem to be all kinds of things coming against you. Mm -hmm. Temptations yeah. that you weren't really aware of before. There's also common sense. 
How do we explain so much evil in the world? We live in a world where, where terrible things happen. Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire was part of the UN peacekeeping force in Rwanda, and he witnessed the genocide there in 1994. Because he had only a small number of officers, he was unable to stop it. Afterwards, he wrote a book, and he called it Shake Hands with the Devil. He wrote this, I know that there's a God, because in Rwanda, I shook hands with the devil. I've seen him, I've smelled him, I've touched him. I know the devil exists, and therefore, I know that there's a God. There are two equal and opposite dangers when we think about evil. One danger is complete disbelief, and the other is an unhealthy and excessive interest in the powers and the practices of evil. Things like Ouija boards, tarot cards, horoscopes, palm reading, that kind of thing. People who are on a spiritual search often experiment with these kind of things. It's not the unforgivable sin, but if you do it, then turn from it, repent from it, get rid of any books or anything in your life associated with it, because we're not supposed to have an unhealthy interest with these things. Yeah, the devil wants to destroy our lives. Jesus described the devil as a thief who wants to rob us. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That is his ultimate aim. It's the complete opposite of what Jesus wants for your life. Jesus loves you. He said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's what God wants for you, fullness of life. The devil's aim is to destroy and he uses clever tactics. It's never obvious at the start where he's trying to take you. I was accused of murder when I was 15. At 16 year old, I, I eventually went to jail and I went to a detention centre called Medemsley. It was very, very harsh. In that place, I was told what to do and I wouldn't do it. I was anti-authority. I had, I had a lot of physical beatings in there. I was put in solitary confinement a lot and, and it didn't help me. I just thought these people were bullies. So when I got out of there, I was more angry than when I went in. I was an embarrassment to my mother. She said, you know what? She said, you're the son of Satan. You're evil. She said, you're worse than your father ever was. Now that was bad to me because my dad was very violent to my mum, often raped her. So for me, for her to say I was worse than my dad, it was the son of Satan, it just got me really angry. And so my next step was to become a football hooligan. I started getting slashed, I got cut up across my face, I had my little finger chopped off. I was stabbed four times in the arm and chest. I've had a bottle in both eyes, I've got no front teeth. I had both my shoulders, my arms pulled out my sockets. It was anarchy. I loved to fight the things I did, which I couldn't mention, really. But I did some very, very, very seriously evil things. I was evil. I was she evil. The devil wants to lead us on a path to destruction. So what are the devil's tactics? Well, the first is doubt. All of the important things in life require faith, and therefore they're open to doubt. The devil wants us to doubt our beliefs and believe our doubts. But God wants us to doubt our doubts and believe our beliefs. The devil lies and causes us to doubt who we are and who God is. Jesus describes the devil as a liar and the father of lies. In the Garden of Eden, in the opening chapters of Genesis, which is really an expose of how evil works, the devil is described in terms of a serpent whose opening line to humanity is, did God really say? He casts doubt on what God has said. We see that really clearly with Jesus. At his baptism in the River Jordan, the words of the Father come from heaven. This is my Son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. And immediately afterwards, Jesus is led out into the desert and the devil comes to him. And his opening line is, if you are the Son of God. In other words, the devil tries to make Jesus doubt his identity. The devil will try to get you to doubt God's goodness, to persuade you that God is a spoil sport who just wants to ruin all your fun. He lies about God's identity and about yours. And if he can get you to doubt your identity as a Christian, as a child of God, then he will. Yeah, many of us struggle with self-doubt. It lies about ourselves that other people have told us and we've ended up believing about ourselves. 
but our true identity is that we are children of God, deeply loved by our Heavenly Father and created in His image for a unique purpose. Another tactic of the devil is temptation. And all of us experience temptation to some degree. Our greatest temptation. Well, uh-huh. Barbecue. <laughs> First thing that came to my mind was food. Mac and cheese. Pickles. Now, I'm from the South, and, you know, barbecue and fish, you know, we can't go wrong. Oh, man. Women. <laughs> Sweet tea. I could go on. Oh my god, please don't do this. Um, immature boys. Weed. Sex. I feel like probably... His <laughs> boys. His <laughs> boys. Weed. <laughs> oh god, women. That's easy. That's really easy. Cursing? Sometimes we just road rage. Milk and cookies. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with being tempted. Everybody's tempted. You can't go through life without experiencing temptation. Jesus was tempted in every way, just like us, except he was without sin. So it's important to make the distinction between temptation and sin. The New Testament makes it clear that it's the devil who tempts us, not God. So in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, Satan is described as the tempter. Occasionally we have a thought that comes into our minds and we think, where did that come from? That's not sin. It's only sin if we adopt it and act on it. But the devil makes us think that we've already messed up and now it doesn't matter what you do because you've already fallen. Then there's a tactic of deception. All sin is a form of deception. Again, in Genesis where the devil in the form of a serpent says, you will not surely die if you disobey God. In other words, it's not gonna do you any harm. But the devil tries to deceive us into thinking that God doesn't love us or want us to have the best in life. Jesus wants you to have life in all its fullness. He loves you. He doesn't want you to experience evil. He wants you to experience good. Yeah, and one of the other titles of the devil is the accuser. He makes us doubt God's goodness and love. He tempts us to break God's commands, which are there for our own protection. And then he accuses and condemns us. There's a big difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. It's when we know exactly what we've done is wrong and we turn away from it and receive forgiveness. But condemnation is from the devil. Condemnation is when we just feel really bad about ourselves. But the New Testament tells us there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. On the cross, Jesus took the condemnation that we deserve upon himself so that we don't have to. Our position in the battle has changed. The Apostle Paul puts it like this. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the Son he loves. In other words, you were in the dominion of darkness, where you could say, in a sense, the devil was in control. But through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, the moment you invite Jesus to come and be part of your life, he transfers you from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of Jesus, where Jesus is in control and there is total freedom. By 1995, I was a tramp and I didn't realize this then. The inside of my body was shutting down, so all I did was drink, take drugs, didn't eat. I didn't realize I was getting septicemia. I had malnutrition and dehydration. In March of 1996, some people turned up on the street and they said to me, do you know Jesus loves you? And I chased them. Jesus, my nana sang about Jesus when I was a kid. There was no such thing a week after they came back. And I seen these Christian men and women on the street for the next six months. One morning I woke up, it was just a normal day. And I got my drink and my drugs and I collapsed. I was rushed to hospital. I was in a coma for six days. My mother was asked to come to the hospital. She went to the hospital. I was dead. I'd had my last rites on the sixth day. Consultant said to my mum that there's nothing I can do. So she said, can I have a few more hours to think about it? So my mum went out of the room and there was a lot of people there come to say goodbye to me. And then Tony, my mate, said to my mum, there's some Christian lads here. And my mum went, well, what good is that going to do? How can that help him? 
he's dead. And they said, well, let us pray for him. So they went and prayed for me, and they put their hands on my head, and they said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, give this man new life. And I woke up, sat up, pulled the mask out my mouth. I was alive, come back to life. But it wasn't just a miraculous waking up of the coma. I woke up totally different. I knew I'd never drink again, I'd take drugs or smoke. I wanted to help people. I actually thought I'd gone insane, to be honest. And these Christian men said to me, do you know what, Graham, you need to go on an alpha course? So I said, what's one of them? We went on the day away, so on the third talk on the afternoon, and I stood up and I said, Jesus, this is the exact words, I've never forgot it, it was November the 9th, 1996, a quarter to three. And I said, Jesus, and I, I've been told you love me, and I kind of believe that you love me, but it's not enough. I need to know something in my heart. And as I said that, and I said, sorry, will you come into my life? I fell back into my chair, and I was crying. I, I couldn't stop. At that moment, as them tears flooded out my eyes, I knew where I was from, I knew who I was, and I knew what I had to do. So that night, at 10 o'clock, I went back to the streets of Middlesbrough, full of Jesus, and I began my ministry. That was 19 years ago. And ever since then, that's what I've done. I've gone, I've told people about Jesus, I've run 141 Alpha courses. There's a couple of things I say to people on the streets or in the prison when I first meet them, because they're full of doubt, you know, I was doubtful. And I say, well, Graham, how do you really know that, you know, you didn't just wake up out of a coma? Now, maybe I did just come out of that coma by coincidence, but I often say, for the last 19 years, why have I lived how I have? You know, where did the violence go? Where did the anger and the rejection and not knowing about love, where did that go in one night? Jesus is supreme love, that's what changes, that's what changed Graham Seed. So if it changed Graham Seed, it does for anyone. So if we experience this transformation, then why do we still struggle with temptation? And why do we still struggle with evil? The decisive moment of the Second World War was D-Day, the 6th of June, 1944. At dawn, thousands of Allied troops began to pour onto these beaches under heavy enemy fire. Though many lives were lost, it was the great breakthrough. Essentially, it was the day the war was won. At the death and resurrection of Jesus, the ultimate victory was won. That was the decisive moment. And the moment you invited Jesus into your life, if you did that, the power of sin was broken. But the war didn't end there. There was a whole period of months of the mopping up operations until VE Day, victory in Europe, on the 8th of May, 1945. In a sense, right now, we live between D-Day and VE Day. The victory has been won, but we're still in this period of the mopping up operations, which will only be complete once Jesus returns and when we get to meet him. And if your experience is anything like mine, when I first encountered Jesus, then a lot changed in my life. But there are other times that I struggle with things, and if I'm honest, I still struggle with them today. One time, a few months ago, I was uh, biking along Oxford Street, and um, uh, I was a little bit away from the pavement because uh, I like to bike a little bit away from the pavement for various reasons and there was a black cab. Do you know the taxi drivers in London, the black cabs? There was a black cab behind me who was getting really impatient and he started hooting on his horn. And then he came right past me because he thought I was holding him up. He came right past me really close and he shot past me and as he went past he shouted at me, you're in the way, move over. And something in my spirit, <laughs> I don't think it was the Holy Spirit, <laughs> said, get him. <laughs> so, the great thing about a bike is you, that the, the cars do have to stop at traffic lights. So he got caught at the traffic light and I managed to catch him up. 
And uh, as I got to alongside, he said, you sh you're, you're in the way, you should move over. I said, what's your number? Because I know they don't like being reported. I said, what's your number? At that moment, the light changed to green. He said, my number, and he drove off. I thought, right, I am going to get him. <laughs> so I started biking after him. And I was looking, at, I was trying to learn his number, 58815. I'm going to report him, 58815. And I could see, he was looking in his rear view mirror, trying to see what I, who, what I was doing. And uh, I managed to catch up, and I got alongside him, and he said, Nicky, you should keep to the rules. <laughs> I thought, did I hear that correctly? <laughs> he said, Nicky, you should keep to the rules. The next thing I knew, he was leaning out of his window, shaking his alpha manual like this. <laughs> so I went up to him and I said, have you done the alpha course? <laughs> He said, yes, I became a Christian on Alpha two months ago. <laughs> so he hadn't had much time for sanctification. <laughs> I said, oh, what's your name? <laughs> he said, my name's Dean. I said, so nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> That must be the devil working. Uh, <laughs> uh, let us reload the player and see what we can do. This is like I remember Lois Sorensen. Yes. She had just read the scripture. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And the computer went dead. <laughs> and some technology. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we were saying. Some technology. It was, it was a good Friday service when we had the artist. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the, all the lights going out? Yeah. Right? yeah. All right. Patience is a virtue. Hang on. Oh, good. Let's see what we got. <laughs> Or we can all start spinning. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Just the other direction. <laughs> yes. Ah. <clears throat> Computer says no. Yeah. Taking a deep breath. Uh -huh. <laughs> Click yeah. one more time. That's right. <laughs> I'll see when it works. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was good. I hope you guys enjoyed it. <laughs> we were pretty close to the end, weren't we? Well, you know, what was so great about that that scene we just saw, I for me, that's the first time I had seen him speak to an audience that large. I mean, it made me very happy to know that that's something he's doing. Okay. And even though it cut out there, I'm, I'm just really thankful to be watching this and to know no. that Nikki has had so much impact on people's lives. I mean, the story we keep hearing these stories of these people who've really rid themselves of evil in within moments and if i could tell you a funny story i it was just a i was i was at a funeral last week for my uncle in virginia at um uh thomas road baptist church so Jerry Falwell's church, Liberty University. This is where my father's family goes to church. And so Jerry Falwell's son gave the sermon. And um, my boyfriend went with me, met my family in Virginia. 
I mean, my boot, my boyfriend's Jewish. And he was so taken by the sermon, how beautiful it was. Everybody had said something about my uncle. He was such a happy man. He was humble, all these wonderful stories, you know, and at the Baptist church, they're going to try to get you to be a Christian at every service, okay? At weddings, at funerals. And so we go into this prayer and he says, okay, repeat after me. My, my boyfriend's in tears. He's just like, oh, wow, this is so, I feel great. This is so beautiful, you know? And we come out of the prayer where the pastor says, repeat after me, this is all you need to do. <laughs> so I look at John, I said, are you still Jewish? <laughs> Are you still? <laughs> it takes only a second to become a Christian. Only a minute, right? Uh, for me, if I if I would conform, it would take me a couple years to be Jewish. So I just thought that that was a what's so really very cool to someone like me is within moments somebody is completely rid of the traumas. They're self induced or their situation has put on them of their traumas. It's, it's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Um, did you see the name of the church where he was speaking? No. It's a very famous um, franchise of churches. Uh, they're massive. They started there in Sydney, Australia. It's called Hillsong. Okay. Well, every once in a while, we'll, he, we'll sing a Hillsong song in church because they, they're massive. There was, there's one in Manhattan, uh, Hillsong, there's one in LA, there's so all over the world, and they're massive uh, so that the worship services are more like modern concerts, you know, with all the mega churches. Uh, well, it's bigger. This is bigger yeah. than a mega church. This is, you know, its own thing, really. So the productions would be like you'd see anybody from Hollywood or Nashville coming out with all the pyrotechnics and all the technology and the, and the um, uh, what do they call the uh, when people are in front of you, but they're not. It's all uh, virtual cameras holograms. or holograms. Yeah. And, oh, wow. So mm -hmm. it's big. If Justin Bieber goes to one of these, oh, you know, yeah. because, <laughs> that's what a lot of entertainers understand. Oh, yes, it's, it's the big yeah. production. So that you see him at the, at the one in Australia, which is the original. Um, so initial reactions just to, to what we saw so far. And, and, and if, I don't think it's going to happen. So uh, we'll, we'll uh, play the end of that probably next week. We'll end. We'll resist the devil one more time uh, <laughs> before we were to tell others. But for me, it's not so much resisting the devil as recognizing the devil first. Yeah. When you don't recognize the devil, then the resistance go. is is almost a moot point. And the devil usually comes in disguise. Yeah. And the disguises can be very, very persuading. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I do is, is I kind of have a, I had to study evil back about 12 years ago with my um, professor from Harvard that uh, we were writing an article and we wanted to understand evil leaders. So I literally spent six months of my life just studying evil. Well, let me tell you, it was not fun. <laughs> I wake up in the middle of the night seeing, you know, evil everywhere. You have to be real careful, you know, when you get into this evil stuff because it can become consuming. But we recognize that there were certain patterns of evil that were showing up. One was evil leaders. And to me, that was the worst evil. And you get a guy like Putin or Kim Jong-un. And you can recognize them like that if you know what you're looking for. You know, and they had certain qualities. They're called the dark triad. They are egomaniacal narcissists, mm -hmm. highly manipulative Machiavellians, mm -hmm. and sadistic, excuse me, um, psychopathic. psychopathic to the point of a sadism. But they, in psychopathic means they have no conscience. So uh -huh. for example, a Putin, can order somebody to kill innocent civilians yeah. and it has no impact. You know, we say, oh, that's so bad, you're a war criminal. He doesn't look at himself as a war criminal, he has no conscience. Yeah. So, so 
and well, a sociopath is a little less extreme than a psychopath, but they're all related. They're very close to but each other. But you saw here, uh, it's very interesting when those interviews are always fun to hear. Um, they didn't go to the standard answer of a Hitler, for example. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, they went to girls and boys. and Because uh, that's the less cheese extreme. Cream. Mm -hmm. So, so we put it extreme, particularly leaders, and we calculated actually in the 20th century that the dark triad leaders were responsible for 165 million deaths in the 20th century. Now I could go through each particular leader if you want, but that gets us off the point. Then we said, you know, take those extremes and moderate them and just make them instead of stream, just extreme, strong. And we said, you know, here were the characteristics that they're really talking about here. Selfishness, temptational manipulation, particularly around power, sex, and money. Those are the three principal ones. They were abusive to people. And sometimes the abuse was, was really a manipulation. Sometimes it was outright abuse. They were <clears throat> mean-spirited. You know, there was a meanness to them. And very often, these are often disguised as attributes rather than deficiencies. So, oh, he's rich and powerful. That must mean he's good. You know, and that's being used all over the place. So recognizing the evil is, it's particularly when it's disguised evil, is really important. And I know I've been burned enough times in life to know, you know, when that evil starts to show up. Mm -hmm. And it's dangerous because we get tricked by it. You know, it, al it always comes disguised as something good or valuable and that mm -hmm. uh, it is tempting. You know, it's like ice cream. <laughs> it tastes good <laughs> until you build it up here. <laughs> the diet, it's evil. Yeah, so, that's right. so what I want you, you to do is to turn to those next to you and kind of share, like Robert, are there times when you've recognized evil? Sure. You've seen it. Maybe it took you a while. That's right. Yeah. Because it came, you know, with a, a nice outfit on, but then all of a sudden you saw it for what it was, maybe after, down the way, after years of experience, or maybe just a very short amount of experience. Are there times where you'd say, I recognized evil there, right? Just five minutes, share that with just those that you're right next to. And, and Michelle, you can just write it down. Uh, I said, well, I'll, I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> no, recognize
You know, when, when you hear uh, either mental or physical it's much easier to call it out. I uh, personally had a major uh, problem with our friends who encouraged the leads to beat up suspects as putting them into cars, backseat cars. It's okay. You know, and oh, this person is, a, you know, a protester in, in the group. Clean him up before you drag him out. And it's a piece of extent that was particularly interesting is that, and of course, you've got others who. Kind of are of that same size. That's where you know, uh, I would be yourself, child. Or they, or they, you know, you know, they, you know, 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 you the finger you are really like it. But it's you know it's fascinating because you have different semantics I give, but words folks are different. Yeah, like uh, like worse as well. Why does it come evil to you know, drink alcohol? If you remember this church, but if you remember this church, it's okay. Right. Without evil. I cannot demonstrate what at, at minimum, it's disrespectful. Yes. <laughs> and I'm really, and not really simple. Uh, it's the, um, the, uh, I often see, uh, Work yeah. of the devil trying to break try and help them to distract themselves away from whether it's mental language, self doubt. Are you trying to fool down yourself? Well, I do not get I know. But I think we all do it. We all do it. So we know it. We know it. Jesus can quickly change a person. Yeah, 
seriously, which is what I didn't do for many, many years. I claimed to believe in God, but I poo-pooed the devil. No power there. And that gave the devil the entrance into my heart <clears throat> because I denied him. I didn't take him as seriously as the Bible does. I didn't take him as seriously as God does. I didn't take him as seriously as Jesus Christ when he said, get thee behind me, Satan. That's a very real thing. And if you, if we don't take the devil as seriously as we take God, that gives him an in. But we also, when we take the devil seriously, we begin to, we, then we take God seriously. And we also find out more of the truth of the Bible, that we have armor, that we have the, the armor of God that we can put on and, the, you know, faith, good heartedness, those things that, that we use. That's how we fight the devil, by inviting by admitting by letting god be our power rather than the devil and it's a fight that that's as human beings we have to fight every day others what did you hear rick one of the things that's impacted me a lot in life is that the devil is not always passive trying to suck me in there's a there are devils out there in, in the face in as human beings who are active aggressors. And, you know, one of the things that I found is uh, there are a lot of litigatory lawyers who represent these adversarial, aggressive, evil people. And they have, they use the law to manipulate and not find justice. They're not looking for solutions. They're looking essentially to shake people down. And there have been a couple of times in my life where I've had to go head to head with mafia. And I'll tell you, it is not fun. They play hardball. And when I say hardball, you know, it could be breaking your knees. It could be, you know, breaking your bank accounts. I mean, this is not, you know, this, this evil stuff is, there's too much of it. You see it in politics today. You see it in the legal profession. Uh, and You've got to be very cunning at times to walk this fine line of not using 
evil to defeat evil, because that's the real temptation. How do you play the high road and still defeat the bad guy? Mm. Not an easy task. What and Jesus I'm not saying that I know how to do that well. What is Luke's gospel? I send you out like sheep among sheep wolves. wolves. Yeah. Still got to take the high road, right? I think yeah. that's the idea of a sheep among yeah. wolves. Right? You don't have a sword by all. You have to use alliances. <laughs> you have to use collaboration, teamwork. If you try to do it alone, you will fail. That's, a, that's an interesting point. That sometimes we do fight our battles alone. Now, others, insights that you picked up as you were talking. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we decided there seems to be more evil in the world now than when we were growing up. I don't know if we're more aware of it or not. Yeah. yeah and yeah. where I and think you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the older we get, mm -hmm. yeah, the smarter maybe. Yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> when you're young and stupid, it's kind of nice. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you just kind of throw yourself out no, of yeah. life because uh, uh, you don't know. Right. But I, isn't this why parents just go crazy, you know, because the kids, you can't go up in trees, you can't do this, you can't do that, because bad things can happen, right? And so yeah. you send your kids off to college and you're just frightened oh, to death oh, because yeah. you know, yeah. but when you went off to college, <laughs> it's like dancing. <laughs> <laughs> went to beer parties. Right? But I, I think for me, what has helped me, and it, it doesn't mean I've resisted evil all the time, but by word of I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. Oh, I have had to repeat that many, many times. Yeah. <laughs> when I was in really bad situations, I just kept saying, oh, Lord, yeah. Yeah. I word of I hid my heart that I may not sin against you. Yeah. I think that's when a lot of people start daily devotions is yeah. they realize in some way, mm -hmm. I got to fight the fight. How do I fight the fight? Well, one way is I read scripture a day or, or I uh, go to regular Bible classes or I talk to other Christians. I have fellowship groups or prayer groups or whatever so that um, I can fight the fight, you know. So yeah. other a good fight. <laughs> remember the three different dimensions. Luther also talked about this too. One is the devil. Is what you were referring to, Patrick. One is the world. We're just constantly surrounded by temptations. The world is that way. And I thought he made an interesting distinction here between the world as functioning as evil and the world that's good that God created. So we just don't blast everything out there. It's just the world. You know? well, no, I think we all know the world is also a delightful place and meant for our pleasure and enjoyment. Uh, but there are aspects of the world, you know, where where and then there's sin in us, right? The, 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 what sometimes you call the old Adam, uh, and now you'd have to say the old Eve in us, you know, uh, that, that just seems to always be there and tempting us, right? Any other? I, I remember um, on the devil side, it was in high school, and my English teacher was desperate to find a book that uh, juniors in high school would want to read. So she gave up on Shakespeare <laughs> or uh, the poetry of Beckett or others. And she chose the newest book that had come out on The Exorcist, thinking we'd all you know, be excited about that. So everybody was. And as we read the book, um, most, I think at the time, just blew it off and said, that, you know, this doesn't exist. And uh, I, I, you know, our church had actually uh, had a ministry to help those who were struggling with evil. And, and so it's just interesting to see how different experiences played a role there. But I'd say most of the students just blew it off. My friend then took the next step and wanted to see the film. Now, compared today to today's horror films, it's, it's probably a mild fare, yeah. but at the time it was, it was not, yeah. it was very powerful. So I remember uh, going to my front door, the, the door was ringing and there he was shaking like a leaf, uh -huh. just shaking like a leaf. Yeah. It, it, the, the movie had done something to him. 
and he wanted me to walk him home. Wow. That was like half a block. Uh, he was shook. Now, why? I'd say most of those who went to that movie probably were not shook. He was. And you could see that this had done damage to him. And so that was the first time I just really noticed that evil had gotten under a friend of mine, gotten under his skin, so to speak. It, just, it, it messed him up for a long, long time. And so, you know, we protect ourselves from those things, right? But other things are more subtle. So I like that too, that as sin is usually subtle, comes, you know, to, so we'd say, well, money can be a temptation. Is money bad? No. Uh, um, uh, men and women can be temptations. Are they bad? Of course not. But the, in the wrong setting, yeah. they be become tempting, whether, mm -hmm. whether it's sex or whether it's, um, whether it's um, money. So good things, can turn bad. We even see that in the Bible where, where uh, even Paul is killing Christians early on. Here he is, a spiritual Pharisee, right? I mean, the pious among the pious. So we can all get caught up. That's the other thing I want to stress. We can all get caught up in something that's evil, thinking we're doing good. And then we look back and we go, oh my goodness, how could I, what was I thinking? But we all get caught up especially in groups. So, you know, you, you get in a group, and a group thing, yeah. and, and it, oh yeah, let's all, you know, and then all of a sudden you find yourself doing something crazy. And, to, and I think that is, um, for me, humbling to know that we're all susceptible to these forces. And yet, as, as Luther would say, uh, we have forgiveness, right? You, you just turn and you confess that, uh, uh, screwed up again, maybe big time, and then we go and we see that cleansing um, that came out very strongly, I think, in the testimony on the film. The uh, words that you just used remind me of the um, uh, prodigal son who, you know, took half of the family treasure, went off to a foreign land. Uh, spent that money on wild things and friends and then came back home and was welcomed and forgiven and so had been you know had succumbed to evil the devil and then came to a realization and was welcomed back home with uh, tremendous joy and love so in the prodigal son, how would you define evil? What was evil about the experience of the prodigal son? I mean, you were already suggesting the well, the um, the 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 phrase that sticks in my mind is, uh, pardon me, loose women. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I forget the term, the few words before that, but it you know implied partying and you know Sex. crazy times yes you know <laughs> now I, I so i was in a cross-cultural group where we were uh studying the prodigal son mm -hmm. very interesting because all westerners profligate living right that's i think the, the nice way of saying it. use a fancy word uh so this guy goes crazy spends his money right, right? and a uh, wine women and so that's how we that's how we Westerners read the story, but that's not how every culture reads the story. The fact that he asked for his inheritance, he was you know, wishing his father dead, and I want my so money. So greed, now. greed, mm -hmm. and, and which meant mm -hmm. his father had to mm -hmm. sell all his assets. Basically, that was not something no. done. No. Father doesn't want to break up the farm, so to yeah. speak. So if you know about how those assets work, this is major, major mm -hmm. rearranging. And right. So some would say greed. Others in Africa said, oh, no, the sin was he left his family. That left him vulnerable because in Africa, you'd never leave your family. Because once you leave your, the protection of the family, oh, then you're susceptible to all sorts of things. Right? Mm -hmm. And then there were Russians in the group. And they said, oh, no, the real problem was the weather. It was a drought. Without a drought, he'd been fine. But there was a drought in the land. And everything got bad. Everything became difficult. I mean, it was, he was fine until the drought happened. And 
none of us had ever experienced a drought. But everybody in Russia had experienced drought and knew what happened to the local economy right. when yes, everything right. dries up. Mm -hmm. And so we're going, wait a minute, that's not in the story. Oh, yeah, it's in the story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the thing about the family. Oh, it's in the story. So each defined evil different in slightly way. different ways. And it's all in the story. Right. And one of the reasons I like that is because evil comes and temptation comes in many, many different ways, forms. I also like in the film, um, and I'll end with this, that we don't become overly obsessive about evil. Because you can get crazy. Mm -hmm. You can just go crazy. You can see demons and devils everywhere. I mean, it's just, uh, and I've been in some churches where you go, oh, just everything is, a, is demonic. I mean, everything is demonic. And you know, your kids are suffering from ADD and that's a demon. Right, I mean, every every little thing, and then you get freaked out, um, and you have this historically in the church where you know it, they paint these pictures of devils flying all around us, and and it's like we're surrounded by all these evil forces, and there's a truth to it, but there's also not a truth to it. Either. There's a trust in God and His protection for us. So I say that only because I've been in churches where the obsession they're seeing almost an un yeah, it's an unhealthy obsession yeah. with evil. And then you, you 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 get it, the teaching and the preaching, and it's like, oh my goodness, you know. Well, they even talked about it leading to like Ouija boards and tarot cards and all yeah. that other kind of stuff, you know. You really don't need to mess Yeah, with. so so I know uh, uh, this was the classic, you know, where girls would mm -hmm. go over to somebody's house and have a sleepover, and they somebody had a Ouija board yeah. and they pick it out and and um, mostly that was not about evil. That was just little girls playing. However, however, yeah. then, uh, uh, you know, my suggestion, well, that's probably not the best game. Can't you find another game? Just one other, anything else aside from <laughs> manipulating and pretending as if evil forces, spiritual forces are moving your hands around the board. So isn't there another way to do it? It's interesting in the Bible. Do you remember um, uh, the, the first king of Israel, Saul? He can't decide on a decision he has to make. So he, he wants to rise, raise up his prophet who had died to give him counsel. That was forbidden. That's witchcraft. Does the Bible say witchcraft does not exist? No. It says don't use it. So it acknowledges there are forces out there and they can be manipulated. You just don't do that as a Christian. We turn to God and say, God, be gracious to me. Lead me God. It also says, put no God before me. No God before me or to the side or to, you know, we don't acknowledge other forces. And again, uh, an African story, almost all the parents would use Western medicine until it didn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. Then they go to the local shaman. Mm -hmm. So you try God. Until it didn't work, and then yeah, there are other options out there. I go with my other options, right? And so that's where I think Scripture is pretty clear. Uh, no, we 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 trust God for protection, for healing, for discernment, for leadership, for protection. I think it's one of the things we can do for our kids and grandkids and for our neighbors is we just pray for God's protection and we trust God. One of the things the Holy Spirit uh, does for us, it protects us from all evil, right? Send some uh, angels. Yeah, we pray that and Luther's prayer is always send your guardian angels. angels. You know, that was the, the reason we, we would emphasize that. The idea uh, is not to get all hung up on angels and right. cherubim and seraphim, but to say God sends God's protection. Michelle, Michelle has a comment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Sunday school, hear no evil, see no evil, think no evil, feel no evil, and speak no evil. Five not just hear, hear, seeing, and speaking, you know, and I had a similar experience. The first bad movie I got to sneak and watch with my sister when I was 12, it was Pet Cemetery, And it, it took the images. So if our, if our bodies are temples, you know, we have that spirit, holy spirit within us to me. And ever since that movie, I've, not watched a lot of things. I, I will get up, leave a room, 
It affects my sleep. It affects how I view the world. I know full grown adults that won't walk through the woods, you know, to someone's house because they saw the movie last week. And so if we're temples of God, I think very slightly, we can be affected by horrific images and sounds. And so that's mm -hmm. my, all I had to say about that. Okay. Okay, well, thanks for sneaking up behind me there. So I think we want to pray for each other and, and pray for the world and pray for those in our church. And it is a prayer, Lord, a garden protect us. We trust in you. And uh, so we don't have to be fearful. We don't have to obsess on these things, but we do share the wisdom as Michelle was, was, was doing. And we share our experiences so we can recognize evil and then resist it. Uh, join me in prayer. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks that you do indeed send your angels to guard and protect us. And we trust in you. We trust that the Holy Spirit will lead us in, in paths of righteousness. Lord, that you would keep us from uh, the evil one, that you would point out temptation. And Lord, when we fall, and we will, we pray indeed that you would forgive us all our sin, keep our minds and our hearts clean by your forgiveness and love. It's, you surround us with the pinions of your wings, Lord, for we need your presence, your protection, your guidance each and every day. And so now bless us for the rest of the day. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.